Hi, it's potential repair time. I say potential because I have no idea if I'm going to be able to fix this thing or not. What is it? It's one of these apartment uh, building complex uh, security entry systems, whatever you want to uh, call them. And this one's actually from the EEV blog uh, Corporate Towers here. And it failed. And the reason I ended up with it is because the um, company that uh, maintains our um, gear in the building here, this one broke down. This is the entry to the um, underground car park, the uh, roller door uh, that goes in to our building here. And it broke down and uh, the company that usually services this sort of stuff said, oh, sorry, they don't make this anymore and uh, we can't buy it anywhere in the world and we can't fix it, blah, blah, blah. And well, I'm um, hmm, smelling a bit of bullshit there. I, I suspect A, you can probably still get it um, somewhere or B, you can get like an upgrade, a replacement unit. And it's an AI phone brand. It doesn't, this particular one doesn't have the uh, model number on it, but this is the, um, we can have a look under here. Here it is. This is the GF uh, model unit. What it does, of course, if you, I'm sure you've seen these as you enter buildings, you drive up in your car or you walk to the entry and then you type in the um, number that you actually uh, want, the apartment uh, or uh, office number and uh, the phone rings here. I've got one on my wall here and then you can talk through here, speaker, microphone, and um, they've got a little LCD here to display various stuff. And then um, the person, if they want to let you in, they can push a button on the phone, which then activates the uh, door and lets you in. So this is called the entrance uh, station. And if we take a look here, um, there's all the buttons. They've got nice little rubber tips on them. Don't mind that at all. That looks like it's uh, going to last a, a fairly long time there. So this is the uh, GF. It comes in different physical configurations. You can get these like it depends on like the type of uh, building but hence why Ta -da! we've got three separate modules because you can actually get different frames and then wire them in different physical uh, configurations. So we've got the one module here, which I believe is the one that's failed because, well, there's nothing else in here. This is just a keypad with some LEDs to then light up if you're wondering what that was. It's just a little diffuser there. And at uh, night, it just lights up the uh, keypad so you can see the numbers you type in, so that's got all the control electronics in it, and this, I don't expect there to be much in there, that's just a um, speaker microphone uh, interface, so uh, the fault is that um, it, it's getting power to it, um, I haven't actually measured it, but you can see that it's got a classic, like um, when your LCD, you haven't initialized the LCD, it comes up with, I'll be able to power it up soon, hopefully, and you'll see that it comes up with just a blank line of characters, it's a two standard two line by 16 character uh, LCD. So it's got to be something to do with this module here and just wire them together in various configurations. And you can have up to, I think this unit can have up to like a whole bunch of these, like dozens of these, and it can have a, up to, this system can have, a, have up to 250 uh, phones hooked up, 50 phones per bus. And this hooks up to a bus, uh, a power supply and bus expansion unit. And they're very simple. I mean, power is in here and then it's got a couple of other uh, pairs over here and it can you can add video to the system as well but this is a voice only system so as i said this is the gf model and they claim you can't get it anymore well it's got a date code of 2004 on it there you go that's not uh too old at all although the system likely uh predates that um and sure enough i think it is a discontinued model but the new one is the gt model looks almost practically identical except it's got a vacuum fluorescent display instead of an lcd and i'd be very oh we've got a real bug there folks hey, there's your there's your problem right there it's got a bug yeah that looks like one crusty old bug <laughs> uh,
Anyway, I think what I was going to say there is that um, uh, the companies who make these types of systems, they like, you know, alarm security systems like we lo looked at before with Nest and stuff like that, a huge thing with these companies is backward compatibility to ensure that new models, uh, you know, at, at least protocol compatible because there's bugger all interface with these, right? It's just like a two-wire interface and you'd be mad if you didn't make it uh, the new one backward compatible with your old ones because people, these sorts of things fail. You know, these buildings last for like, you know, 30 years or something before they upgrade these things. So it, like in our case here, just one particular unit fails. And of course, the people who use that uh, door to the building, they're complaining to the uh, strata committee that, you know, oh, oh, you know, I, why do I pay my uh, strata fees? You know, you've got to fix this. And the, secure, and the uh, installation companies saying, oh, no, we can't. You're going to need a whole new system, blah, blah, blah. And that would uh, it'd be hideously expensive to buy a whole new system. And that's why I'd be very surprised if the new GT uh, series would not be compatible with this GS. So I think they're spinning a bit of uh, BS there just to get themselves a uh, nice, juicy, big uh, contract to install a whole new system. Anyway, let's have a squiz up in here. And how does that? Oh, yeah. Oh, hello. Yep. There we go. Ta-da! We're in like Flynn. That's pretty much all I expected. Not much at all, just a processor and uh, a couple of miscellaneous stuff and Bob's your uncle. Actually, that's really interesting. I'll try and get this on an angle. That looks like that has got a conformal coding on the board. Um, well, actually, not hugely surprising because uh, this is going to be used in an outdoors environment. It's not surprising that they might whack a conformal coating on that board just to uh, uh, keep out the moisture over the long term. Yep, that makes sense. It's quite thin. You can see the part number on there, M3620 ECFP, I think it is. No idea. M Motorola perhaps, but curiously, here we go. Here is the GFNS. So that looks like it's laser etched. V200X, so that could be the version number, so the firmware could have been uh, pre-programmed into here and uh, laser etched, so it could be a ROM, a mask uh, ROM device uh, processor or something like that. And please excuse this, it's not easy to get when they've conformally coded stuff, but bingo, microchip 24LC128, there's our E squared prom for storing all of the information, because this um, thing when it like uh, powers up it has like you can program all of uh, like the apartment names and the things like that into it and you can actually program those directly through the front panel I think or through um, some optional uh, PC software which you hook up to this thing so no surprises for finding E squared prom in there because this is probably like a really old school uh, processor here which uh, doesn't have built in E squared prom. And of course, being a, essentially a multi-drop system, you know, a professional multi-drop system, you probably would have expected like an RS-485 or something like that. But no, look at this, DS14C232. We've got ourselves an RS-232 driver, although that might just be for the, um, uh, the uh, PC um, interface, perhaps. I don't know. I think we have to take the board out. There might be some more on the bottom, but yeah, I mean, they're the only three chips on the top side here. And by the way, the way I ended up with this is that the uh, Strata manager uh, was confronted with the ultimatum from the um, maintenance company saying, yeah, you know, we can't uh, find any replacement for this. Oh, no, we've scoured the world, can't do it. And well, you're probably up for a new system. So, of course, he knew I was into this sort of stuff and, go, and went, well, you fix electronics, don't you? <sighs> goodness. Anyway, not much on the bottom here. I do see a fuse, of course, when you're servicing this sort of stuff. You're going to check a surface mount fuse like that. I wish it would be that easy. But as I said, I do see the LCD light up, um, as, in the, um, as in power getting to it, because I can see a row of characters. I'll power it up in a second. Um, it's powered from 24 volts uh, DC, but there's, yeah, there's bugger all... Uh, on the bottom here, actually, yes, I think that RS-232 chip um, is handling the uh, PC interface because this is like a vertical uh, TRS 
um, jack here, which then the traces wiggle their way down there. Sorry, excuse the crudity of my finger. Um, basically down to here near the RS-232 chip. And without buzzing that out, I'd say, yep. That's what she's doing. So that's the PC interface. When you hook the PC interface uh, up, it just hooks up to your RS-232 port. So where the drivers are for the uh, for the line, um, I don't know. I mean, we've got ourselves something, a big uh, D-pack there, whether or not that's a transistor or a uh, voltage reg, I'm not sure. Have to have a closer look. Actually, without knowing more details of the system, I am speculating here, but I think it's actually sending data over the uh, audio line. I think that's what's happening here. So this uh, processor will uh, maybe uh, encode some uh, audio, um, you know, some sort of data over that audio pair. How it's actually doing that, I don't know, because there's not a lot of miscellaneous circuitry there. I mean, you know, there's our resonator for the... Uh, processor and that's about it unless that actually is like a custom uh, you know ASIC which is uh, which is doing all that um, it may not just be an off-the-shelf processor that's kind of like the only conclusion I can really come to at this point I think we've got ourselves some opto couplers there by the looks of it but yeah there's not much in here so let's power it up and see if we can replicate the fault so here we go, 24 volts, it says it draws uh, 70 milliamps, so I'll set the current limit to uh, 0.1 amp there, and let's switch this puppy on and see what happens. So I got the polarity correct, yep, well anyway, it's already dead, I can't kill it much more. Well, yeah, you can always kill it more, you can always widelerize it, I guess. Here we go, on. Ta-da, there it is. That's exactly what we were getting. So as I said, the row of... Uh, characters and it's drawing about 60 milliamps so um you know that, that's about on it's rated for 70 so well, the current draws there we're getting good contrast on our lcd but it's not booting up um presumably unless the character's there normally like it scrolls when it's just idle it scrolls the name of the installation uh company there so um yeah hmm anyway that's a standard uh uh hitachi chipset uh 16 by 2 display and well it's dead but obviously power's getting to it but golden rule of troubleshooting thou shall test voltages now the thing with probing uh, conformally coded boards of course you've got to actually pierce through the conformal coding because if you pro like you might be probing that down there and putting a little bit of pressure on it but not actually piercing uh, that conformal coding and of course that's an insulator so you have to really put a lot of force in there and have very sharp probes to actually probe through otherwise you can think that you're getting nothing there your meter might be reading zero you might think okay I'm making contact I'm pushing like I normally do uh, with the normal amount of pressure and I'm getting nothing but there is actually voltage there there so anyway let's uh, uh sorry if i'm obscuring what i'm probing here i'm going to probe this d-pack down here so through zippity doo da zippity dee 24 volts there we go 24 volts are one pin and on the other see if i just probe that not like like light pressure i don't get anything but, hey, bingo, there we go, 5.21. So, yeah, 5 volt rail, not surprising, and it's within spec, it's a little bit high, but within spec. So, that's all right, I'm assuming that's the rail. And, of course, you can verify that, you just pick an easy-to-probe chip with a known uh, rail pins. In this case, the E-squared prime, we know pins 4 and 8 are going to be our power rails. As I said, light touch there, no voltage. You've got to push down, pierce... Bingo, there we go, 5.2, so yeah, maybe, oh, there maybe there's a little bit drop there, perhaps, but not at that sort of current, so yeah, maybe that wasn't the uh, rail, but anyway, we do have a 5 point, um, well, a basically a 5 volt rail, so that's just fine and dandy. And the fuse on here, yes, I have powered off, yep, it's fine. And, you know, other basic things, you might just uh, basically probe things that are easy to probe. Um, yeah, yeah, you can go, you can argue, oh, yeah, let's just go through it systematically. But, you know, look, there's a big power resistor there. It's got 121 on it. So that's uh, 120 ohms. The one at the end, of course, represents one zero. And it's a big power resistor. Why is it a power resistor? Well, because it's dissipating a lot of power. What happens when things dissipate a lot of power? Well, they can 
possibly, if it's not designed right or there's an overload of stress or something, they can uh, go open. So, why not? Check that. Because it's easy and it's trivial. And there we go, it's 120 ohms. Fine, rule that out. Now, I just had a look at the uh, manual for this thing, which I'll link in down below, and it says actually to reset the thing, put the um, dip switch on for two seconds. Uh, number one, dip switch number one. We have dip switch number one is already on. So, Maybe, no, um, uh, well, whoop, there we go, maybe no wonder, like this is supposed to like reset all the firmware and everything in it, so I'm like, well, that makes sense. Let's see what happens if we flick that switch back. That'd be embarrassing. No, nothing, well maybe the uh, installers have tried to do that because they know that's what the dip switch does, perhaps. Well, let me repower it. And, uh, the dip switch, no, okay, Mwah. so much for that. Well, because that's a classic uh, symptom of an LCD not being initialized like that, you've got to assume that, like, either the process is dead or not starting up, or maybe the E squared prom is dead, which held the staff, but we've done the resetty thing and nothing's going, so we're going to get the scope out and we're going to have a look at the, uh, to see if anything's... Oscillating, and it sure as heck is. There we go, 4 meg. No worries whatsoever, our processor is oscillating. So, hmm. And from memory, I'm fairly sure all these four status LEDs on the front aren't supposed to be on either. So, yep, our processor simply is not working. And because I can, I'll check the power supply. And, well, there's the 5 volts, and, well, we got a bit of... Uh, crustiness happening there, but uh, nothing that would upset a digital system, I'm absolutely sure. So, yeah, I don't know, it's, um, yep, it's gone beyond the easy stage, I suspect. Now, because this is uh, like a masked ROM uh, device, essentially, um, and our problem really is that, uh, you know, thing is not booting and we're getting nothing on our LCD. It could be working for all I know, but the LCD could be uh, dead. I've tried actually punching in the uh, program uh, code on the front here that's in the manual. But anyway, because our problem is that pesky LCD, let's try and probe some stuff to see if there's any, here we go, any action happening on our screen. Let's got to be careful to make sure you're actually probing. No, I got a bit excited there, as you do when you start seeing things like this. See, you'll occasionally see something like that as you're probing and unprobing. You think, aha, signal, but no, there's bloody well not. There's enough all there, so there's no data going to that LCD. And of course, next stop, I could probably, uh, when it powers on, uh, see if there, if I can uh, capture anything. I'm on pin four there. Pins four, five, and six are the ones that. Uh, matter for us, they're the control pins, and uh, you whack your scope in single mode, and let's switch it on at a slow sweet speed, and bingo, it switches on, but there's nothing, um, it's just uh, slowly ramping up there, we get absolutely nothing, and uh, let's try it again, oh, <laughs> sorry, let's try it again. No, no, see, we'd expect to see, you know, after the process is booted up, we'd expect to see a burst of activity um, go into the LCD, but we don't, so that basically, um, well, that's going to stay low, but yeah, like, I think we're on the first data pin now, so let's have a look there, even if it's in 4-bit four, four mode, no, zip. So that's obviously just staying low. It's not doing anything. Oh, oh no, that's just a, uh, it's a furphy. And uh, no, so we're getting no data um, out of the processor going to the LCD. So it's not like the LCD has failed. Uh, we're just getting no data on those pins. That processor is not booting up. This is not looking good. It has our custom... Uh, A6 slash processor failed. Well, power supply is okay. The clock's okay. I got no data on it. What's left?
So really, that is not looking promising, I'm afraid, because, well, yeah, you know, you've gone through the basics. You measure the power, you measure the oscillator, you measure the signals going to the screen, which is our main, well, our only symptom that we've got is that the thing doesn't uh, boot, things like that, by the activity on the LEDs, and we're just getting no response. And, of course, the system that, you know, when you plug it into the system, it's not like it, it still works, like the audio and everything uh, still works, and but you just can't uh, see anything on the screen. So it's not that. It definitely is... Uh, dead as a dodo, and um, why? I mean, there's nothing else on there. So it oscillates, we've got power, and the conclusion I'm coming to at the moment is um, we've got ourselves a, uh, a rooted chip there. But yeah, I mean, it oscillates, but hey, you know, it can be rooted and, uh, and still oscillate, because the oscillator's going to be, you know, its own little free-running oscillator in there. It just needs an inverter, and uh, it can uh, start up. So... Yeah, mm, without more data on this thing, I don't know. Um, e squared prom lines, maybe. That's my last resort. So there you go. I've checked the lines on the uh, I squared C bus on the E squared prom there, and that like it just boots up as you'd expect because of the pull ups, and and then does nothing. There's no activity um, for you know many hundreds of milliseconds after that, taking out the time base. No, it just doesn't boot up. So it's not even trying to access the E squared prom. So, you know, I thought, oh yeah, maybe the E squared prom's failed and, and the firmware in there's not that great that it doesn't do diagnostics, you know. Um, but a well-designed unit, of course, well-designed firmware, of course, would, uh, of course, uh, initialize the LCD first before doing anything and then uh, put, you know, if it failed the E squared prom, then, you know, just read out garbage or whatever, didn't get a checksum or whatever it was, um, and couldn't read or write a test bit, then uh, uh, it would actually display a fault code or, you know, um, fault information on there. But we're not getting anything. It's not even booting up the, um, and not even initializing the LCD. It's not initializing the E squared prom. That processor is cactus. Well, stop the presses. We found out what this uh, chip is, and I obviously didn't look uh, hard enough, but uh, a couple of people on uh, the forum and Patreon pointed this out. Thank you very much. It's a um, Mitsubishi, now Renesis, of course, uh, M16C processor. So it's you know, one of the old school ones, but uh, you can still get them. Renesis still sell a uh, variant of this thing, and ta-da, we have the pinout. So... Now we actually have a few options because if we didn't know what that chip is, then well, that probably would have been the end of it because we don't know, uh, you know, any of the pinouts. So we can't um, just, you know, you could probably, if you're really desperate, spend many, many, many hours or days on it and maybe you might get somewhere, get lucky. But now that we have the data sheet, we have something to follow. So I suspect what it comes down to now is it's going to be one of two faults. Either the chip is dead, it's died in some way, blown in some way, who knows, I don't know. Or the, uh, or the I don't know, the ROM inside has, has failed after, it's not that old though, it's only 10 years old, so, you know, you wouldn't expect it to fail. Or... Uh, so the chip is either faulty or there's something holding it in a reset state because clearly this is not booting up at all So it's not doing anything. The oscillator is running. Of course the oscillator will always run It's a free running oscillator on these things in this case with a resonator here, but um, it, Perhaps the processor is being held in a reset state that was that could be the only really two things I can think of that would stop this thing executing and booting up like this so let's probe the reset pin and there it is there pin 12 it's as usual it's a uh, not reset so it's an active low so um, if that pin pin 12 is low after the, this applies power then we can trace it and figure out what's going on Aha, uh -huh. here's a trap for young players that uh, just got me, so I'll share my experience here. I just uh, lifted up this resonator here. I just sort of, uh, you know, pushed it aside because it was covering exactly where the reset pin was supposed to be. So to get access to that and see where the trace was going, I just sort of bent it up about 30 degrees and I heard a crack. 
and oops, I forgot that um, this board was conformally coded. And well, if you do that, yeah, that's probably where the crack came from, but it shouldn't have been enough to damage that. But anyway, I then, then probed the oscillator and I couldn't actually see anything. And I thought, oh no, I've screwed the resonator on this thing. And I don't you know, like I've cracked it internally or something dumb, even though it was just you know, as you do all the time with through hole parts, you sort of just move them aside that, you know, you don't wiggle them back and forth. I'll just break off. But it's OK if you just sort of move it once like that to get access to something, uh, as long as you don't push it back. Um, and sure enough, um, I couldn't measure anything. Let's have a look. So here it is here. I'm probing the pin like this. OK, so I'm making good contact. There we go, but it's showing nothing. Look, no oscillation whatsoever. And I thought, oh, I've screwed the pooch with this. I've damaged it, but no, uh-huh. It's a pebcac. Problem exists between the, um, in this case, the oscilloscope and, well, the chair I'm not sitting on, um, i.e. it's me, dummy, because I didn't realize that my scope from last time I used it was in high resolution mode. And in high resolution mode, it averages out. And I was using a slow time base, 20 milliseconds per division. Watch what happens if I turn the time base up. Aha, uh -huh, look at that. There it is. It's oscillating just fine. But because we're at a slow time base and I've got high res mode turned on from before, which is not normally visible, there's nothing to tell you that. See, I mean, normally at any time base, you're going to see that signal and you go, aha, uh -huh, okay, I'm at the wrong time base and do that. So there you go. Just a trap for young players. Be careful what mode your scope is in. High res mode, bit of a trap. Anyway, it turns out the reset pin comes over to a resistor and a capacitor. Not surprising. And it's also right next to, I'll show you, right next to a teeny tiny I haven't chased the tracks yet, but uh, right next to a teeny tiny um, five pin SOT 23 there. So that could be a power on reset chip. So, uh huh, that could be something wrong there. Anyway, so this resistor in this capacitor here, I can probe this resistor and that is low. So, of course, the processor's not going to do anything. Uh huh, we're getting somewhere. Oh, and by the way, the other thing I'm going to do as well is just pull these cables out here just in case they make a difference, like uh, like uh, maybe the reset line's going out there or something holding them low. No, it's not that. And yep, that most certainly is a power on reset chip. Take a look at it, because here's the, uh, here's pin uh, 12, the reset pin, so it snakes around there. And bingo, it goes to an RC right in there and that goes over to this puppy right here and it's uh, because of the bloody conformal coding next to impossible but I have gotten might be able to get it there anyway I have gotten it under the mantis um, which is uh, the oh, it's like the best thing on the planet for looking at uh, the chip numbers the mantis scope let me tell you and it's um, BY3223 now, please excuse the uh, crudity of this. It's next to impossible to shoot this through the mantis. You've got to get the right ocular path, one of the stereo paths on here. But anyway, it's much clearer um, to my eye through the mantis scope than it might be on the camera here. But anyway, you can see BY3223 is the marking code on there to Google. Now, unfortunately, I can't uh, find any data on that. I've asked on Twitter, but nobody's gotten back to me. Not unusual for SMD codes like this. They're a pain in the ass. Anyway, it doesn't really matter because um, I know it's a, a, a across the 5-volt rail there. So it's measuring the 5-volt rail. And we know the 5-volt rail's there. So I reckon that power on reset chip likely to be a dud. Anyway, the way we can prove it without uh, desoldering it is to um, uh, put a low impedance across the output to the positive rail so that uh, drag it high, do that maybe a 100 ohm resistor. And of course, we've got to pierce through the conformal coding and we can do that with our sharp meter probes. And the way to do that is to put it in current mode here, microamps mode. And we, if we get another meter, I'll show you why we can do that because you don't want to short it out with zero ohms. So... 
Ta-da! We got a 101, a 100 ohm sense resistor in there. So this is a, uh, this instantly becomes a 100 ohm resistor with nice sharp multimeter probe points we can get in there and short that pin. Let's do it. All right, let's give this a bell. I'm going to short this out to the uh, 100 ohms short to the positive rail. So we know that pin is low. I've measured it. So here we go. Let's see if the LCD does anything. Ta-da! Ah, look! There you go! There you go! The process is working! Bingo! Sweet! Look at that! Winner! Bingo! There we go. It's supposed to scroll like that, um, but maybe because, well, I, I haven't got the keyboard or anything hooked up, uh, anything hooked up but anyway, it shows that uh, the processor is now working, initializing the LCD, and Bob's your uncle. So, I reckon that chip has to be faulty. It's got to be, because all it is is a, across the 5 volt rail, it's measuring the, if the 5 volt rail dips, it just uh, very cleanly resets the processor. That, that's what these little reset chips are designed to do. I, but this one has died, clearly, because there's nothing else there. It's just across the 5 volt rail. So, how or why it died, I don't know. But anyway, let's whip it out. All right, I'm just going to get in there with two irons. You could do this several, one of several ways, but uh, there we go. Gonski. All right, that chip is gone. And the great thing about this is that we don't have to do anything because it's already got an RC circuit on there, uh, like a pull-up. It's already got a pull-up to VCC, which is what we want because it's an active low reset uh, pin. So we want it to be normally high, but on power up, we want it to be low. So it's got that RC circuit already on there beauty. And the great thing about these power on reset chips, they're one of the few components in electronics that aren't strictly necessary. They're in there as just a nice bit of engineering, you know, so when, so when you get brownouts and dips in your power supply and stuff like that, it doesn't lock up the chip. So it, it recovers and resets gracefully, but it's not strictly necessary. So anyway, I've removed the chip. Let's turn this on and see what happens. Oh, 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 well, that just made a complete ass out of me, didn't it? I was talking that up like there was no tomorrow. And uh, let's see if we can uh, short that pin. Like, I don't know what value cap and resistor are in there, but let's see if we can uh, short that. No, it obviously needs now to be shorted to ground. So let's. Maybe short that out to ground. Oh, no, it doesn't, doesn't like that. Doesn't like that at all now. That's very, very surprising. Wow. Now, here's the really interesting thing. I'm now probing the reset line, which has a 10K resistor going high. I have actually measured it and it is stuck low. Look at that. It, the damn thing is stuck low. No wonder it's not booting. Um, so there's probably nothing wrong with that chip at all. Is it the... Have we got a failure in that processor after all that's causing it to go low? I'm going to have to do some uh, visual inspection. I, I did it before and it didn't look like there was a solder short or anything there. So, yeah, that's interesting. So what I'm going to do is check the continuity of that. Should probably turn the power off, Dolt. Check the resistance there. No, look at that. 12k to ground. So it's not like it's it's not like it's like shorted to ground. So it's not a short or anything like that. So if we measure the pull-up resistor here. Here we go. Measure the pull-up. And it's bang on 10k, and that's exactly what it says it should be. And it's 12k. Um, you know, it's like not a 12k resistor in there, but it's like the um, PN junction in there is like, or whatever else it's, I believe it's only going to the PN junction. So it maybe that chip is dodgy. So unfortunately, it's doing exactly the same thing as what it was before. But uh, once again, I can get it to get to that point. So I can get the processor to power up, but I don't know whether or not it's still... Uh, locked up or not, but I could get it to go as far as the uh, 
Let's try that again. I'll hold it there. Oh, yeah, there we go. So now it's working. It's actually scrolling scrolling that text. So there you go. Yeah, I've got to hold that pin. I've got to short... Oh, you can't see that, sorry. But you've got to... Yeah, and then it actually locks up. If I remove the short, there you go. It locked up halfway during the scroll there. And of course, that's possible because the process is uh, reset. It's no longer working, but the character memory inside the LCD here actually keeps that data on the screen. So that's why you'll still see the text there, even though the process has gone away and reset itself. Right, so it seems like that 10K pull-up is just not enough to do the business. We know 100 ohms works. So I'm thinking about putting 1K across there now and well, just to, just to bodge this thing up and get it working again to the point where I can just switch the power on and have the damn thing uh, reset and, um, and work, then I think I'll just uh, whack in like a 1K resistor, try that, lower the values until it works. I don't know uh, why it's not working with a 10K pull-up. It should, but maybe there is um, something a bit fishy with the uh, chip with the reset pin on that chip, perhaps. Well, this really is quite something. I've... Um uh, taking out the capacitor there, because it could have been like a failed cap uh, going to ground there, which was, uh, you know, it had some sort of maybe a voltage dependency uh, failure mode or something like that that was causing it to go uh, low impedance. But I've taken that out. Exactly the same thing happens. I can get it to work if I short, uh, well, 100 ohm um, short with the... Uh, uh, meter here, um, hi, I tried a 1k resistor, hi, no, nothing, so I think what I'm going to do is um, just uh, desolder that uh, 10k and whack in a 100 ohm, I mean, it's horribly low value, but geez, I, I don't know, what else can I do? I just tried a 270 ohm resistor in there and it didn't work, unbelievable, this is, I've now put a 100 ohm resistor in there, not, not a bloody sausage. Yet, yeah, let's see if I can do this trick again with the meter. Yep, yep, the meter works. You can't see that, and maybe you can't see that LCD scrolling, but it is unbelievable. So, uh, like, it's the same value as this 100 ohms. What the hell's going on? There's some weird, maybe, I don't know voltage dependency issue with the input or something i have no idea but that is i've got a hundred ohm pull up there and that is not enough to do it it's just locked up again all right let's have a look at this pin look at that it's just it's not quite ground and that's with a hundred ohm pull up hundred ohm pull up folks unbelievable all right, check this out. I've now got my amps jack, so it's basically like 10 milliohms or something. It's effectively a dead short. Look at that. Even the contrast, it's now working. Look, and the contrast is correct now, but it's drawing 146, 147 milliamps. Um, whereas before, like it's only rated for 70. So I've managed to actually make it better because it was always a very, even when it was operating out there, the contrast was really low on this thing. But yeah, it's like you practically got to short this thing out to make it work. Unbelievable. Okay, what I can do now, look at this. I've got 10 ohms dialed in there now and I can actually, 20 ohms, it's still working. 30. 40, it stops. There you go. So at 30 ohms, uh, in parallel with the uh, uh, 100 ohms I've got in there, it's working. But anything above that is no good. So there's something like there, there's something gone wrong with that uh, reset pin and it's pulling everything lower. I can't see any board contamination or anything like that. So that is that looks like the only way to get the damn thing working. And there it is. It's uh, drawing 136 milliamps, which is more than what it's uh, rated to draw. But we're sort of, because we're, like, it, this thing has failed. I'm pretty sure it's got to. There's nothing else there. That track doesn't go anywhere else. So I think the chip has failed, and we're now sort of just, you know, forcing it to work. And, you know, that's, it's not the ideal fix, but it kind of is not a bad fi fix. If you can get it working... And which it now 
seems to be, I reckon if I go put that back in, um, she'll work a treat. So, you know, it's not like I'm dead short in it out. I could put a, like a, you know, a 22 ohm resistor in there or something uh, up to the positive rail and, uh, well, yeah, that's, it's going to draw a bit more current, but yeah, I think it'll be all right. And for those who think it might have been uh, uh, like a short on the board, contamination between pins, I've gone around there with the scalpel under the microscope and I've actually scraped out the conformal coating between the pins, scraped around between the trace and the uh, ground plane around the resonator there. And um, yeah, I, it's still doing exactly the same thing. So the only conclusion I can come to is that, yeah, the input, the reset input of that chip is uh, fried in some way, shape or form. Now the problem I've got here is that um, I've just uh, tried, I'm shorting 30 ohms across there, uh, that reset pin up to positive and of course I power it on and because there's no initial reset pulse it's um the processor doesn't have like an internal uh reset by the looks of it so it looks like or it's part of the failure mode uh perhaps that it's not working so even if I whack a 30 ohm or a 20 like 2 ohm in there or even short it out when I boot it up uh, power it up it's not going to work so I need to actually uh, power it up like this with a higher value and then short it out and it seems to work. So uh, it's not looking like an easy fix, even though we've found the problem. I think now we're getting somewhere. I've gotten medieval on its ass and I've actually lifted the reset pin. So you'll notice that it's not working at the moment, but if I touch that pin, ta-da! I can get that to work and you'll notice that there's no current draw either. So into that pin. Bingo, was there actually contamination on the board that, or something that I couldn't get rid of with the scalpel? Hmm. Okay, so what I've done now is I've lifted the pin and, uh, sorry I won't show you, it's pretty horrific, but I've lifted the pin there and I've uh, glued it onto the resonator there just to take the stress out of there because if you accidentally bend this uh, jumper wire, this isn't a permanent mod by the way, it's just uh, temporary to test it. Um, yeah, if you bend that you can snap it right off and that's going to ruin your day. So what I've got is I've got a pull-up resistor there and now I can um, repower that but it doesn't boot up every time. Probably, oh, I don't know, making a fool out of me. It was like one in five times before and now it's like, now it's not. So, <clears throat> trust me, it was kind of booting up, but yeah, it still seems to be one sick puppy. There is still something, something wrong there. So, I don't know. But uh, check out this five volt ripple now. I am definitely not happy with that. Look at that. I mean, yeah, it's going down a minimum of 4.8, um, but it is it is getting really bad now. So I don't know. It seems to be getting progressively worse. The failure is uh, getting worse. We just, like, we need to do something about that. All right, I've taken out that little 100 mic uh, 25 volt surface mount cap. Didn't have another uh, suitable surface mount cap, so I just bodged in a uh, regular axial one there. No worries, it's 220 mic, so... Uh, at 50 volts. Look at that. Clean as a whistle. So it looks like we had a dodgy power supply there, a dodgy cap, that um, that could explain on the rail why it took out. Um, well, we don't know whether or not the voltage supervisor had been taken out or whether or not it's the pin. We still don't know uh, in the micro, the reset pin, but that could explain it. The power supply could have actually taken out that reset circuit so yeah that's as clean as a whistle now very happy with that but it still doesn't boot properly because i don't have a cap in there no this is not looking good folks i've got a proper pull up in there i've got a proper pull down resistor so we've got you know the classic rc uh boot up network values don't seem to matter and um it's still pretty random whether or not it uh actually turns on oh trust me look look, look at those Look, massive brightness on those LEDs. What the hell's... What the hell is going on there? Oh, we're at current limit. We're at, we're at current limit. Something's horribly wrong. Look, I've got it set for 200 milliamp current limit now, and we're at 197. No, 
No, something, something's horribly wrong, folks. This is one sick puppy, I'm afraid. No, what the hell is going on there? Wow. So we can actually get it to work. And the LEDs are back to normal again, but let's repower that. I'm just, uh, and look, when we get that full brightness there and the 197 milliamps, that's our 5 volt rail. It's still fine. So it's not like the 5 volt rail is failing. There is something else horribly wrong. Look, I can cycle the power there. Now it's, no, it's still high again. No, it looks like it's going to stay in that state for a while. No, there we go. Now it's normal and it's working. Look, and it's drawing, well, 96, higher than what it's um, supposed to, nominal, um, supposed to be 70 milliamps. But, uh, yeah, I, look, <laughs> what's this video been going for, like 45 minutes or something? And, well, I am out of, uh, well and truly out of uh, time for today because it is... Ta -da! Yes, it's getting quite late. I better actually get home. Yes, I haven't got myself a proper new sports watch to replace. If you're following me on Twitter, I did lose the other one, the uh, Timex one you've seen before. So, unfortunately... Um, anyway, I'll get a new watch. But, uh, look, I don't trust this thing at all. I mean, yeah, okay, we managed to sort of fix it in quote marks, get to the point where, well, it's, you know, it, it like the process is talking, the, uh, every, it looks as this, this is exactly what the screen you get when the thing is installed properly there. But when we get these sort of issues with, um, you know, some bizarre reset issue, and then now we're getting some ridiculous random overcurrent thing, ah, oh, it's like, you know, I throw my hands up and go, well, no, I'm not going to trust this. Um, because, no, there's something, obviously, something else seriously wrong with it. So I think that's a loser. I wouldn't trust installing this back in. And, uh, you know, unless I figure out what's going on with these the, these two LEDs here and the high current uh, consumption, it's just, it's just way too dicky. And... Well, I have no clue what that is. I have no schematic for this thing. All we know is what the processor is, and uh, I couldn't be bothered tracing it out. And Yeah, sorry, folks. This is, I, well, I guess you could say that's a win, right? I reckon that is a repair win right there, because we went through the whole flow of this thing and um, found that, the you know, traced through the reset thing and all that and um, and actually got it back up and, and running. So I... I'm going to call that one a win, even though I don't think I'm going to be able to put this thing back into operation. I'm going to tell them, nope, it's dodgy as. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that um, uh, 90 per 95 percent repair video. There you go. Hope you learned something. Um, a lot of people say that even if I don't fix the things, they do like the uh, troubleshooting procedures and uh, stuff like that. And um, I I agree. Even if, uh, you know, I always continue to put up the videos, even if I don't repair the thing, because I think that they're uh, worthwhile learning experiences. So if you like that, please give it a big thumbs up. And if you want to discuss it, EV blog forum is down below and follow me on Twitter. And uh, and if you want to support me, uh, Patreon is the way to do it. The Patreon link is down below as well. Thank you for everyone who um, helps support the blog through the Patreon channel. It's, and it's better than uh, PayPal donations. I'm sort of going away from that. Patreon's a much better uh, system to uh, support supporters. So there you go. I think I've had a gut full of this. I'm going home. Getting Sunday. Catch you next time.